He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. When we hear the word antibiotics, most of us immediately envision a little red and white capsule containing some modern synthetic drug and ingested in order to cure some bacterial infection. But any discussion of antibacterial antibiotics must start with the realization that antibiotics have been known, albeit indirectly, for millennia as they occur all over the natural world. Of course, as we discussed earlier in the series, the search for natural extracts with which to alleviate disease had historically been based on blind trial and error, and not on the principles of modern research emphasizing the study of mechanism of action, industrial manufacturing, high level of quality control, and optimized dosage, as it is today. We have also already discussed how Salversan, a drug against syphilis, was developed by Paul Ehrlich in Germany and marketed by Hoechst. Despite the unpleasant injection procedure and a host of nasty side effects, the drug was a great success, and coupled with the second-generation analog Neosalversan, was the most frequently prescribed drug against the disease until the advent of penicillins in the 1940s. We also previously discussed the birth of the modern pharma industry in Germany as the product of the transformation of the dye industry and the first modern medicinal products to be generated by this burgeoning industry hit the market around the turn of the 20th century. The effort of the German pharma industry was crippled by World War I, but eventually the large German businesses restarted their R&D efforts. After Salversan's success, companies continued the same research techniques in the hope of defeating some of the other more prevalent bacterial diseases. The random screening approach invented by Paul Ehrlich was integrated into drug research strategies at most pharma companies. Nowadays, companies still operate this way, but the screening has been automated and is extremely rapid. Companies own chemical libraries with millions of different compounds and are able to identify preliminary drugs in a matter of days. In the 1920s and 30s, these libraries did not exist, and as Ehrlich had done, compounds had to be made one by one. However, companies like Bayer and Hoechst had the advantage of possessing thousands of dyes in their compound libraries, as these were the chemicals that had been made while searching for new coloring agents. It was already known that bacteria could be stained for better visualization under the microscope using a series of dyes. This indicated that some of these dyes were taken up by bacteria. The principles of the new approach that was developed on this basis are therefore quite simple. One placed a bacterial culture in a petri dish and fed it different doses of a dye. One then compared the bacterial growth of these dishes against a culture fed only with nutrients and determined whether the compound had antibacterial value. The goal was, of course, to kill the bacteria under examination with as low a dose as possible. The next experiments were made in mice or rabbits which had been infected with the pathogen under study. At this time, Bayer and Hoechst were a part of IG Farben, a huge German conglomerate also comprised of BASF, Agfa, Casella, and Kalle, founded in 1925. This huge monopolistic chemical enterprise was broken up again after World War II. But before that would transpire, research at IG Farben in the early 1930s led to the first important class of broad-spectrum antibiotics, the sulfa drugs. The first important drug from this class was a red chemical called Prontosil, which was synthesized by Bayer chemists in 1932 and studied by Gerhard Domach for antibacterial activity in a number of bacterial infections, such as Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and E. coli. Prontosil turned out to be a prodrug, or a precursor to an active drug which was already known, and therefore ineligible for a patent. This triggered some frantic research to discover some new improved patentable sulfa drugs, aided by the fact that the compounds were quite simple to make. This led to the more active second-generation antibacterials of this class. 
For a little backstory, in World War I, bacterial infections took a toll on armies even more than bombs did. Wounded soldiers usually developed lethal infections and died. Gerhard Domach was a student in 1914, and he left his studies in Germany to join the army. He served in several military hospitals, and the spectacle of so many soldiers dying from infections made an indelible impression on him. Once he got back home, he decided he would try to find a general cure against bacterial infections. After completing his studies, Domach became the director of the Institute of Experimental Pathology at IG Farben. It was here that Domach led the research team that invented Prontosil. Now back to the 1930s and the search for new sulfur drugs after Prontosil. Apparently, Domach's young daughter developed a blood infection after cutting her finger with a needle. Domach decided to treat her with one of the new experimental drugs, a sulfamid, and she was quickly cured. In spite of early successes like this, the medical establishment was skeptical that such a simple drug could act as a general weapon against bacterial infections. In those days, crude immunotherapies were preferred, but were impractical against such a broad spectrum of mutating pathogens. Domach published his work in 1935, but his results did not generate the interest he had hoped for. However, Prontosil received a sudden boost from events in the United States in 1936. Prontosil was administered to the son of the 32nd president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., who was suffering from a potentially deadly streptococcus infection. He was cured by the new German antibiotic, and this sparked a sensation in America. From 1935 until 1942, doctors always used Prontosil or other sulfa drugs to fight all bacterial infections, until the next wonder drugs, the penicillins, became more widely available. But prior to that, one of the first tragedies brought about by ethical drugs occurred in 1937. In this era, drug regulations were very limited. The company Massengill decided to sell the active ingredient of Prontosil as a solution, and they marketed an elixir of sulfanilamide, a 10% solution of Prontosil in diethylene glycol. Chemist Harold Watkins prepared the solution and added flavoring agents for ease of consumption. Within a few months, 105 people died from liver and kidney damage caused by diethylene glycol. Watkins killed himself in response as he felt responsible for these deaths. But in those days, clinical studies had not been formally mandated, and manufacturers were not required to carry out toxicity testing on finished medications. As it would seem, the toxicity of diethylene glycol was not fully appreciated at that time. In response to this incident, U.S. Congress passed the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which was the first step aimed at regulating drug safety. In 1939, Domach was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Fearing retaliation from the Nazi regime, Domach replied that he had to obtain government approval to accept the award. However, Hitler had made it illegal for Germans to accept a Nobel Prize, because the committee had chosen for the 1935 Peace Prize Karl von Ossitzky, a German pacifist and enemy of the Nazi party. Domach was actually imprisoned by the Gestapo for precautionary reasons. They required signed papers from him in which he formally declined the prize. Finally, in 1947, once the Nazi party was ousted from power, he was able to travel to Stockholm and accept his prize. When World War II erupted, essentially every German, American, and British soldier was carrying a vial of sulfa drug to ingest or sprinkle on wounds. In addition, army doctors gave out powder and pills to anyone threatened with any sort of infection. Sulfa production, both in the U.S. and Europe, was boosted to make hundreds of tons of the drugs available to anyone who needed them. Ironically, as is told by author Thomas Hager in his book about Domach, the medicine that helped the United States in World War II was discovered in a laboratory in Germany in the year Hitler came to power by a corporation whose executives would be put on trial for war crimes at Nuremberg. It would change the way new drugs are developed, approved, and sold. It would transform the way physicians deal with patients. It would usher in the era of antibiotics and lay the foundation for what we now consider modern medicine. 
In the early 1940s, despite the discovery of the sulfa drugs, many infectious diseases still could not be treated. The drugs were mainly active against what we refer to as gram-positive bacteria, while research on other pathogens, like gram-negative bacteria, was not making much progress. That was until mankind stumbled upon the next class of miracle drugs, the penicillins, and this will be the focus of the next chapter in our story. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.